Hello there, I'm Daniel and welcome to my channel. I'm so glad that you guys are here and I'm so glad to be here making another video for you guys. If you've been following my channel at all, you know that I do a lot of book reviews and one person that I've been covering extensively is C.S. Lewis. I got a whole box set collection of his books and I've been doing, I've been going through each book and doing a book review for each one. And my goal is to complete the whole box set. But while I've been doing that, I've been trying to get a little bit more information about C.S. Lewis, what kind of guy he is. I've been watching documentaries about his life growing up and I've been learning about him in his older days and just kind of getting a feel for the guy because if you truly understand an author, it makes it easier to understand what they're getting at whenever you're reading their books. And so I've been trying to do that for you guys. That way I can put out better content and fill in the blanks for some of the books that he's writing. And so I ran into C.S. Lewis's last interview and it did not take long for me to be very impressed at the way he took a fairly casual interview, an interview about books, writing, getting into writing, things like that. And he turned it into a deeply meaningful, sophisticated, philosophical conversation. If you've read C.S. Lewis, especially his nonfiction works, I guess you kind of would expect that at this point. This interview took place all the way in the 60s, and I know a lot of people say that old books, old words, old essays, they don't apply because the world's different now and things have changed, but I say absolutely wrong. When I read these words, my mind was just blown because it was like he was speaking to us in the present day, as if with all the chaos and all the crazy and all the conflict that's happening in the world around us right now, C.S. Lewis was speaking directly into it. These words are relevant to the church of today because he was speaking to the church of the 60s, to Christian authors of today because he was speaking to Christian authors of the 60s. But not only that, but anybody who really values truth, who values being honest with themselves, can gain something impactful from the words that he said in this interview. So with that being said, let's dive on into this interview. C.S. Lewis is a very intelligent man. At this point in time, he's the professor of Renaissance and medieval writing at Cambridge University. He's also studied a lot of mythology and the mythos. When you read the Chronicles of Narnia, it's very apparent that he's done his research and that he's read all the ancient tales. But even though C.S. Lewis had a profession in writing, he's most famously known for being a great Christian philosopher and theologian. So for this specific interview, Sherwood Elliot Wirt came really asking about writing. He wanted to know about Christian writings, Christian authors. He wanted to be able to get some inspiration for people that possibly wanted to look into a career in writing in the future. He wanted to get some wise words about telling stories, about influencing Christians using writing and other things like that. And once we get really into it, C.S. Lewis really takes the interview by the horns and takes control of the situation and gives so much more than I think the interviewer expected. Before I get directly into quoting C.S. Lewis, I wanna bring up that I think too often, we look at the timeline behind us and we expect that everything right now is completely different than what happened back then, back in the 60s, so long ago. The world is a completely different place. People don't think the same whatsoever. But so often, when I'm reading the books, the works of C.S. Lewis, I think, oh my goodness, he could have written this book yesterday. I mean, he's an Englishman and he did write it back in the day. So his writing is overly sophisticated to the point of being complicated in a way. But it is still, once you get through the vines and you kind of get to the root of what he's saying, it is amazing how relevant his words are today. So the interview starts off with a little bit of small talk and asking how newer authors can get inspiration for their writing. But then I started taking notes once I was gripped by what C.S. Lewis was saying. So Wirt asked the question, what is your opinion of the kind of writing being done in the Christian church today? I did not expect the interview to go in this direction. I honestly did have no expectations for what the interview would be about. C.S. Lewis responded, a great deal of what is being published by writers in the religious tradition is a scandal, and it is actually turning people away from the church. The liberal writers who are continually accommodating and whittling down the truth of the gospels are responsible. I cannot understand how a man can appear in print claiming to disbelieve everything that he presupposes when he puts on the surplus. 
I feel it is a form of prostitution. I think that this interviewer was just taken aback whenever he got this response. I don't think that he ever expected to go this deep, to dive this deep into Lewis's ideas about Christian writing. And like I said about relevance, this isn't something that was only applicable to the 60s. These are people that are taking the gospel, spinning it to make it popular for their own personal gain. When he talks about putting on the surplus, he's talking about being in the pulpit, saying one thing in front of people, but then writing a complete opposite thing, being two-faced. I mean, today we see this all the time. All the time these Christian leaders and pastors are being called out about watering down the gospel, about appealing to the masses, all for popularity. It's as if the power of the gospel is so weak that these new pastors need to make up for it by popularity, by pop culture, and other things of the sort. Whatever the new trend is, we add that into the gospel because clearly the gospel must be weak and puny and we need to supplement it with all of these things. And C.S. Lewis is saying that it's appalling. Whittling down the gospel is absolutely absurd, appalling, and he feels it is a form of prostitution. Those are very strong words. So in the interview, they get to the point of saying that there is something wrong, and then they have the conversation, and then they get to a point of what is wrong, and one of the things they talk about is repentance and sin, and Wirt ends up bringing up a quote from Chesterton, saying, I believe it was Chesterton who was asked why he became a member of the church, and he replied, to get rid of my sins. Repentance and sin is something that in today's age is kind of put into the corner because we don't want to tell people that they can no longer sin to follow Jesus, to follow Christ. We tell people that whatever you do, the way that you live your life is great and we want you to keep doing that. You just need Jesus. And it doesn't mean anything. There's no, there's no value to it. There's no worth to what they're saying. They're just sprinkling Jesus on top of pop culture society and thinking that it's just the band-aid on the bullet hole and that it'll do the trick. And now they're addressing that sin does need to be addressed, that we can't just ignore sin. And Lewis says, it is not enough to want to get rid of one's sins. He said, we also need to believe in the one who saves us from our sins. Not only do we need to recognize that we are sinners, we need to believe in a savior who takes away sin. Matthew Arnold once wrote, nor does the being hungry prove that we have bread. Because we know we are sinners, it does not follow that we are saved. So Lewis is saying that even if you recognize, even if you can get people to recognize the way that they're living is wrong. And in order to recognize that, you have to say there is a right way to live. And Lewis talks a lot about this in The Abolition of Man. For there to be a wrong way to live, for there to be a sin, there has to be a right way to live. There has to be a standard at which you're supposed to meet. If sin is missing the mark, there has to be a mark. And Lewis is saying, being hungry does not prove that you have bread. Just like knowing that you're a sinner doesn't prove that you have Christ. And that is something, Lewis just has all of these sayings that I've never heard before. That you could go to church your whole life and then Lewis will just tear everything you've ever known in one sentence. And it's, it's amazing the way that he does that. But he just has so much experience and he's read so many works and so many books and has had so many points of views to be able to analyze things at. C.S. Lewis wasn't born into the faith. He was an atheist. And then he came into the faith later on in his life. So he's able to have that discussion and have that point of view as somebody who was a sinner, had to recognize that he was a sinner and not only needed that, but also needed to find a way to take away sin, which ultimately ended up being Jesus Christ. This next part really brings it home for me because what I've been seeing is a watering down of the gospel. What I've been thinking about and noticing is that our gospel has been watered down to accommodate people that don't want to repent. Our gospel has, yes, Christians meet people where they are. Yes, Christ meets people where they are. But it was never for the intent to leave them there. And so Wirtz asks, how can we foster the encounter of people with Jesus Christ? And Lewis just hits him with, you can't lay down a pattern for God. 
There are many ways of bringing people into his kingdom, but we can block it in many ways. As Christians, we are tempted to make unnecessary concessions to those outside the faith. We give in too much. There comes a time when we must show that we disagree. We must show our Christian colors. If we are to be true to Jesus Christ, we can't remain silent or concede everything away. That is extremely powerful. What he's saying is that there is no pattern for God. There's not just a formula that we can use to evangelize people. There's not just a formula you can do to make the perfect church service. But then he says, while there's not just a one-size-fits-all way to bring people to Christ, there are many ways to turn people away from Christ. And then he says that in the church, we make too many unnecessary concessions for those outside of the faith. We just say, you know what? This is too big of a pill for you to swallow, so let's just shrink it down. Let's only cut out the part that says Jesus forgives you and loves you and feed that to you because anything that's deeper is going to turn you away from the faith. But the problem is, is that you never brought them into the faith in the first place because you sold them a false gospel. He says that it's important for us as Christians to simply show our true colors, no matter what happens. So for a brief summary, Wirt is asking about writing. What do you think about these Christian authors? And Lewis is saying, we are watering down the gospel. We're trying to accommodate the gospel to make it easier for people outside the faith. We're being dishonest. And these things are going to turn people away from the faith in more ways than it's going to bring people to the faith. When it comes to trying to be popular and trying to follow pop culture and just love people because that's what Jesus would do, what I always directly think about is the disciples of Jesus. I think about how they were so popular and everybody loved them so much that they got nice homes and people said, you're really supporting us and you did all these good things for us and we're so glad and the governments and the police just brought them into their arms and gave them hugs and supported them throughout all of their journeys. Oh, wait, that never happened. All of them actually were killed or sent away to an island to die or crucified upside down because of their faith. They didn't water down their faith to make the Romans happy. They didn't water down their faith to make the Jews happy. They said, hey, this is the gospel. I'm just going to keep saying it. Take it or leave it. Nobody conceded to be popular. Nobody took a knee to be favorable with society. Nobody was trying to ever be popular. They said, oh my goodness, Christ came. He gave us this awesome gift of grace, of redemption. We can turn away from our sins and be more like Christ every day. And we're not going to water down the gospel at any point. And they lived that way to the point of being killed. They didn't get any prizes. They didn't get any awards. They didn't win any popularity contests. That was just it. So how is it that nowadays we care so much about what everybody thinks about our faith and about our gospel that we won't talk about it, that we'll say that whatever new belief comes out this week, we agree and support. How is this happening? It doesn't make any sense. Because if you look back in the Bible and the way that people lived their lives after encountering the actual physical Jesus Christ, they did the exact opposite. So it just seems pretty plain to me. And it seems, although I don't want to put any words in Lewis's mouth, I would like you to go read them yourself. Honestly, you can just look up the last interview with C.S. Lewis. You can go read his books and you'll get a pretty good feel for how he felt about conceding to people outside the faith about whittling down the gospel. You don't have to ask me or watch this video. You can go ask him yourself because everything is lasting forever on the amazing internet. So it's always all well and good for me to bring up a problem and say, C.S. Lewis recognized this problem. When I read this interview, I felt like he was recognizing our problem as well. But then there's really the question of, so what? what you gave me a problem and now I have a problem too. What do I do with it? And I think 
that the answer is simply just to actually understand if you're a Christian, if you're in the Christian faith, to read your Bible and to know what it says so that you can follow the gospel instead of what people tell you to follow. And if you're outside the faith, lessons to take away from this as well are if you actually believe in legitimate truth, if you believe that there is a moral standard or if you believe that something can actually be validly true, that whenever people tell you that you should concede and just follow the popular science, you should stand your ground. When you say the earth is round and people are going to burn you at the stake, I mean, if it's worth your life, then stand by it. Too often, people mask or hide the truth for the sake of an easy conversation. People are too afraid to be honest with each other, and it seems like it's really tearing society up, if you ask me. Everybody's too afraid to say what they're really thinking, and the only people who are getting their say out are the people that are threatening violence and anger to do it. I would definitely encourage you that if you have a strong belief, if you have a strong opinion, if you have a faith, to learn it and to understand it and to stand by it. Make sure that you actually believe the things that you're standing by and have a reason for the things that you believe. That's one of the callings within the Bible, to have a reason for every question, to give an answer to those who ask. And if you don't have that, then as soon as somebody says, well, you can actually do whatever you want and it doesn't matter if you sin, and your pastor's telling you that, then you go, you gotta be right. That's gotta be the answer. I'm just gonna follow you because I don't know on my own. When the Catholic Church refused to allow the Bible to be printed in English, people actually died to have those words translated so that common people could know and believe for themselves without having somebody else tell them what to think. Right now, anybody in the world can have access to the Bible. Anybody can pick it up and read it for themselves, but we all fail to do that miserably. So if we would all just actually learn what our faith says, actually learn what the gospel says, and to not waver with that whenever a new pop trend comes along, then we would be consistent as C.S. Lewis wishes that we would be. Man, I think this video went way deeper than I honestly expected that it was gonna be. I read you some C.S. Lewis quotes. I, I, think, I think I might have yelled at you at some point. I uh, definitely went on a tangent, but this is definitely something that I'm very passionate about, something that I encounter on a regular basis. I hope that you guys were able to dissect what I was saying, to learn something from it. If you disagree with my point of view, if you see things completely differently, if you hate everything that I said, let me know down in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear what you're thinking as well. Does it seem like what C.S. Lewis said in those interviews is relevant today? Do you think that they're outdated? Do you think that everything really does change every other week and science evolves every other week and truth evolves every other week and we just gotta keep up? Or do you think that there is a standard, that there is a moral truth, that there is truth in general and objective reality that we can see and touch and understand? Or do you think that everything is kind of just whatever you want it to be that day? Let me know down in the comments below. I'm so glad that you guys were able to watch this video. I hope that you all chew on it, think about it, pray about it, and have an absolutely wonderful day. See you guys later.